Good evening. It's good to see everybody made it out this evening, especially for anybody that was here this morning and knew I was the one talking and decided to come back anyway. And for anybody who just found out, I apologize in advance. You know, one thing I noticed last week, we had a lot of uh, good speakers during our vacation Bible school, and I think just about every one of them uh, expressed how thankful they were to come up and, and to be able to talk each night. But I don't know that I can go quite that far to say that I'm thankful. I'd rather be sitting back here with my family where I usually do, but you're stuck with me regardless, so we'll make the best of it. But uh, you won't be able to tell this from any of my speaking ability, anything I've ever done uh, in a public manner, but I actually have had some public speaking classes, one, at least one in high school and even in college as well. And I remember uh, my college teacher telling us before a speech that he assigned to us to pick out a topic that we knew something about already, do something that we knew something about that we had an interest in, and it generally made things easier. And so this evening I'm going to try to remember that technique and to talk about something that I may not know a whole lot about myself, but something that I've seen throughout my lifetime, and that is uh, to talk about good workers here this evening. And again, you can ask my dad, I'm not the hardest worker, I'm not at all a, a talented worker, at least when it comes to a physical sense, but I have been blessed to be around a lot of good, hardworking people in my life, a lot of talented workers. Uh, we have a lot of good, hard workers here at Sandyville, a lot of talented people. And one thing I've noticed, though, over the last few years about good, hard workers is that they seem to be getting harder to, to find these days. And it's a problem that me and my dad deal with in our work each and every day. It seems like we have a hard time trying to find and keep good workers. And it's not something that, that we ran into only. We talked to a lot of other different employers in the area, people who always say the same thing. They just can't find enough good people to help. And I've also seen that play out in a lot of different ways in the last few years, in ways that I wouldn't have ever guessed. Places like Dunkin' Donuts, where Dad always loves to go, or to McDonald's, different places. I couldn't tell you how many times in the last three to four years, show up one of these places, there'd be a note in the door that says, sorry, that our lobby's closed today. We didn't have enough workers. Or maybe it's limited to drive through only. I don't know if you guys have seen some of that stuff, but we've seen that a lot here in the last three to four years. And not only that, but even at, at parts stores, at hardware stores, anywhere around, you name it, if you go into a business and try to get help with something, it doesn't take long to find out. There might be only one or two people there that actually know what they're talking about and somebody that can actually help you out. And the more I see situations like this and, and run into these things, it makes me wonder if God doesn't feel the same way sometimes when he's looking down at his people. And I know when I see the, the direction that a lot of people seem to be going in in our country, people who have fewer morals than what they used to have, let alone people who are actually trying to live a godly life. I can't help but wonder sometimes if God doesn't look down and think the same thing that I do and wonders, where are all the workers? And Harvey, you wanted the title. That's the title of my lesson tonight is, Where Are All the Workers? And it doesn't take long as we look in the Bible to see that this has been a problem since the very beginning. We can look in Genesis chapter 6, and I'm going to read verses 5 through 8 right here. And I already had it marked, so it ain't going to take me no time to turn to it. But Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. And it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Then we look at verse 8, it says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And we see here just in a few passages that out of the entire population on the earth at this point, there was only one man and his family that God ends up saving from destruction. And another quick example that I thought of uh, that relates to the same thought uh, comes from Exodus chapter 32. And it says in Exodus 32, beginning in verse 1, it says that now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, 
we do not know what has become of him. And as we read on throughout these passages, we, we know that Aaron actually ends up making them a golden calf to worship. And if we skip through to verse 7 here in, in the same chapter, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Go, get down, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. And so we see another event here where this time around an entire nation of people, out of all that, all, all of them people, only one person, Moses, is doing what God has asked him to do and that God is pleased with. And we can look at different places where, this, where you can see this at in the Bible. Another one comes in Matthew 26 that I thought of uh, when Jesus was in the, in the garden. It says in verse 40 that he came to his disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, what, could you not watch with me one hour? And there's really uh, so many different places we, c- we can look in the Bible and we can see where God has always had what I call a lack of manpower when it comes to his workers. And, and without trying to go through and trying to find all these places tonight, one other uh, place that I thought kind of sums all it up comes from Matthew chapter 9 and begins in verse 37. And this is where Jesus says that the harvest truly is plentiful, but the labors are few. And he goes on to say, Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And so... No matter where we look at, we see here that there's not a lot of workers, and we see even from this last couple of verses, it says that there's a lot of work that can be done in God's kingdom, but there's just not that many workers that's going to do it. And it doesn't take long here, as I said, that to see there's always been a shortage of people who God could look at and say that they are really workers in his kingdom. And I actually considered this evening to try to put up a couple of pictures that go along with these thoughts, but... I decided it wouldn't be worth trying to get my computer linked up to the overhead. And so I'll just tell you, and, you're, and, and maybe you can imagine with me here, uh, i got two pictures that I'd like for you to think of this evening. And if I would have had the first picture up, it would be like this here. It would be a picture of a job site. And to me, a job site, I always picture a construction type of job site. And, and on this job site, I'd like for us to imagine we got a lot of workers, at least 15, 20 different workers or so on this job site, but the boss isn't currently there. And so instead of the people working like they should be here in this first picture, we can imagine, we see a lot of people standing around, people laughing, people on their cell phones, probably playing fantasy football or gambling online or something. Uh, maybe some guys standing around smoking on their 20th smoke break of the day. Whatever it is they're doing, maybe one to two people that's actually working on this job site. Then I would have had a second picture to compare and a a picture where the boss is standing there on the job. Maybe he's looking over these guys' shoulder. Maybe maybe he just pulled in and the guys in the first picture seen him and started pretending they were working, whatever the case may be. Picture number two has the boss there standing. And nobody on the job is smiling. Everybody's working as hard as they can. Everybody's focused trying to get their job done. And I know that we can picture something like that easily, and probably a lot of us have seen that play out in life. We know that there are good workers and there are bad workers when it comes to work. And I always wonder, when I think about those things, is what does God see when he looks down at his workers? Not even at uh, at the world as a whole, but maybe just as Christian people, people who have decided to obey his word. Does he see the people that I described in picture number one, the people who really don't have a sense of urgency to be getting the job done, or as he see the guys in picture number two, the people who know that the boss is always watching and people who are trying their best to stay on task. And this evening, as I like to consider good workers and bad workers, I like to talk about a few characteristics that make good people uh, good workers in the physical sense and also how those apply to good workers that God will be looking for also. And the first one of those I like to consider is that a good worker to me is a proud worker. And obviously we know that the Bible is against pride when it comes to a arrogant or boastful manner, but I believe that a good worker should be proud of the work that they do. And I believe we can look in Genesis uh, in chapter one, verse 31, it says, Then God saw everything that he made, and indeed, it was good. 
And I think that that same feeling that God had when he looked at his creation can apply to anybody. To anyone, uh, when you're dedicating your time to be good at something, uh, you should be able to reflect on that and know that you did a good job. And I know that anything that I've ever been involved in, uh, especially something that was difficult and that was challenging to me, whether it was a group effort or something I did by myself, anytime I, I'm able to see something get done at the end, I always feel like, like I've really done something. And it makes me feel good to be a part of that. And I think there's really two key things that come from a person who takes pride in their work. And one of those things is the feeling of accomplishment. And I think that, that you can get that feeling whether you get the exact outcome that you were hoping for or not. And, but I believe that if, if you're taking pride in what you're doing and trying your best to get the right outcome, I believe you can always feel accomplished. And I believe a second thing that comes from being accomplished and taking pride in your work is somebody who also becomes confident because you know that anything that ever comes up that you're going to be able to do your best and to work through it. And I believe that God is looking for that in people as well. I believe that he wants us to be proud of the work that we're doing. And I believe he wants us and expects us to be confident in his word also. And I also believe that if we don't take pride in our work, whether that's in the spiritual side or the physical side of things, I believe if we're not looking for that accomplishment, that the odds are we're not ever going to accomplish very much. And I had a couple of uh, verses, a couple of passages I thought kind of went with those thoughts. Uh, one of those comes from James chapter 2, verses 17 through 18, that says, Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And another passage that I thought went with these thoughts as well comes from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, that says to be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And the key word that I see there, it says that a good worker is someone who is not ashamed, someone that knows that they did the best that they could. And so the question becomes, as we consider this characteristic of a good worker, is that can you look at the work that you have done as a Christian in your life and be proud of what you are doing? And can you be proud of some of the areas that you've grown in, whether that's in personal growth or maybe helping somebody else in, in their development, maybe somebody who works behind the scenes, whatever it is, there's really a lot of ways that we can be serving God. But... The question really remains, are you ready to see God face to face and honestly say that you're proud of the amount of effort and the amount of work that you're putting in to serving him? And as I continue on to think about other characteristics that I think a lot of good workers have is that I think most good workers are planners, that are people who plan ahead. And I think we have a good example of that in Matthew chapter 25. And I'm going to read some verses here. I'm going to read... Matthew 25, I'm going to read verses 1 through 12. And it says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins, who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil and their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. At midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us, and you go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went out to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. And so we see here that a good Christian worker should be planning ahead to be ready for the things that are to come. And we know that in a physical sense that a good worker isn't somebody who shows up on the job and walks around with his hands in his pockets wondering and waiting for somebody to show him what to do that day. A good worker is somebody who comes to the job site prepared, somebody who knows what they want to accomplish that day, and they know the steps that they need to be taking throughout the day to make that happen. And 
I believe that we should be serving God in that same way, that, that we need to show up for worship with the, same, with the right mindset that tells God that, that I'm here and I'm not just here physically to, to show that I'm here or to put my time in for the week, but a, a mindset that says that I care and I chose to be here. And I believe that we should be planning each day to, to know what challenges we might face throughout the day, wherever that might be, and know how we're going to react to each of those challenges. And I think about planners, I believe that people who plan ahead are people who are purposeful and, and believe that they are deliberate in what they do. And I believe that God expects our actions throughout our day and throughout our lives to reflect that as well. And continuing on to think about another characteristic that I believe a, a good Christian or a good worker of any kind has, and that characteristic is, is knowledge. And I believe that a knowledgeable worker is definitely set out more so than, than the rest of the, of the group. And I have a couple of verses as well that kind of goes with that thought. Uh, the first one I'm going to read comes from 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I'm going to read verses 2 through 5. And it says, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And to do any of those things, we know. That's going to take a good amount of knowledge to be able to do what God has asked us to do here. And I have one other verse that also goes with that thought, and that comes from Hosea chapter 4, and it's verse 6. that says that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being a priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. And we can see here that not only do we need the knowledge, we see that a lack of knowledge is actually what is going to be leading to destruction. And I know in a physical sense, again, that, that if we come across somebody that is genuinely good at their job, it doesn't take you any time at all to figure that out as you talk to that person. And I, I can give you a good example that, of what me and my dad have ran into in that here recently. Uh, I don't know how many months ago this happened, but a few months ago, we had some guys that worked for us that decided they could install a couple of garage doors. And I can hear my, my dad laughing already. Uh, the garage doors have not worked since they put them up. I don't know how many months, probably six months ago, they put these garage doors up. And dad would ask him every week, hey, did you fix the garage doors yet? No, always some kind of reason we're going to try this next. Didn't happen. Months go by. Ask him, they couldn't get it fixed. So finally, he made them call themselves last week to get a professional garage door installer. It didn't take long after he showed up to tell this guy knew exactly what he was talking about. He knew all the little parts that kept the door from working, just little small things. But he knew exactly what it took to fix the door, and it, it didn't take it, no time at all to figure out. He knew, and we didn't know. And I believe the same should be true of us as a Christian, that we should have a similar type of knowledge to that. We need to have a working knowledge about the Bible, maybe not have every single thing memorized, but have a pretty basic concept of what God's Word tells us and to be able to know where certain things are found in the Bible and to be able to know for ourselves and for others uh, of what we need to do and why we need to do exactly what God has told us. And I believe that just like the, the person we had to call to help, help come and fix the garage door, that we could tell instantly that, we, that he knew what he was talking about, I believe that people around us should be able to see that in our lives as well, to know that, that we know how to live life in the right way. And as we continue on here, uh, I actually had a couple of other characteristics I'm going to throw in, and that is some characteristics that lead to being a bad worker. And uh, one I always think of with people that we've seen that's worked for us is something that I call people who have the time card punching mentality. People who show up just to beat their time in for the week. And those are the people who really aren't interested in doing a good job themselves. They're not interested in their own growth and development. And they don't really care how their job affects anybody else. They're just there to get their paycheck. 
And I think there's a lot of people probably in our world today who have that mentality. But one person I know who's not going to take that mentality is God. And I know that as a spiritual worker, God's not going to look to that very favorably. And I don't know if very many people know, but there are actually a handful of jobs out there that you can get that offer part-time hours but have a full-time insurance. So you're not working a full 40-hour work week, but you're still able to get the full insurance. Typically, there are jobs that don't pay a lot on the hour, and you're basically just working for the insurance. But they do exist out there. But one thing I know about when it comes to the Christian worker is that God does not offer that same plan. He does not offer full-time benefits for part-time Christians. And a verse, uh, a couple of verses I'd like to look at that kind of goes with that thought comes from Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. And it says that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I think think there'll be a lot of people who think their name is on the payroll sometimes, as for example in this case, but we see here that God doesn't even know who they are. And another quality of a bad worker is something that I'm going to call as a double dipper. And I know a lot of people anymore have two jobs, and there's nothing wrong with having more than one job, but I could easily see if that was the case that maybe one job could outweigh the other job. And if you ever got to the point where, where you couldn't do both jobs and one job was really lacking because you, you know, one job took up all your time, you'd have to eventually make a choice to which job you wanted to stick with. And I believe that a double, dip, double dipper worker could be somebody who maybe spends most of their day playing on their cell phone, stealing time away from their boss, not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, a double dipper could be someone who maybe stays up all night playing video games day after day and, and they show up for the job, but... They're really not effective at it. And whatever the the situation might be, I'm going to call a double dipper, somebody who who is at their job and they're wanting the paycheck, but their thoughts really aren't focused on the job and they're really thinking about something else at all times. And we know that, that God sees this type of mentality with people sometimes. And we know that God does not want us to treat him as our second priority in life. And I had a couple of verses that goes along with that thought as well. And one of those comes from Revelation chapter 3. And it says that I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. And another one of those uh, I had written down here would come from Luke chapter 16. that says that no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So we see here from these verses that God doesn't want us to try to just live for ourselves for the week, to be focused on things that only benefit us in our personal lives, and then try to give him our leftovers on Sunday, that it will not be acceptable to him. And the final characteristic that I had that I thought of, uh, and it comes back to being on with the good workers, is that of availability. And I believe that most good workers are willing to make themselves available when something comes up. And there's a a saying in sports that I'll steal here that I think can apply to being a Christian, that they say sometimes that the best ability is availability. And I believe that that saying could easily be applied to a Christian because if we aren't making ourselves available to God, the odds are he's not going to even recognize us as a worker to start with. And we all know the parable of talents. Uh, Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 19. Uh, I won't read them here right now, but where the master gives the different servants their talents, and the first two servants double their money. And then we look at the third one, and actually I will turn over to that part. We'll, We'll read verses 24 through 26 here where the, the third servant is returning his talents back to the master. And it says here, if I can find it, 
Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. And so we see here, that God's not going to be happy if we're not trying to do our best. And we know that being a Christian is not just a spectator sport. It's something that we don't get to watch others do and that we don't take part in ourselves. We have to always try to expand our own abilities and make ourselves available to God. And I can say that for myself tonight, that I really didn't want to be the preacher. I don't have a goal in mind to become a preacher not trying to, to gain experience for that. But I also know that if I don't make myself available sometimes to do things that I don't want to do, that I'm likely not going to grow very much as a Christian as well. And so we know in the physical world that the most reliable workers don't refuse a challenge. And good workers often do things that they don't like doing in the moment, but they always find a way to make that happen. And I believe that God expects us to do the same thing. And I believe there's a lot of ways that we can be making ourselves available for God. Uh, one of those, obviously, is being here for worship services. And if not taking part in a public manner, uh, there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes that makes everything else to be able to be effective. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do to uh, encourage other people, listening to people, and to help others around, around us during the week. But Whatever the case may be, I believe that good workers, whether in the Christian sense or in the spirit or on the physical side of things, sometimes have to do things they don't always want to do in that moment. But no matter what it is, I believe that we should always be making ourselves available to God in some way. And as we consider these characteristics this evening, and I'll ask again what I asked earlier, is what kind of worker is God seeing when he looks at you. It's easy to slack off when we feel like nobody's watching, just like the people I described who were working in that first picture I described earlier. And it's easy to, to not be motivated whenever we don't feel that pressure. But the thing about God, who is our employer, and much more than that, obviously, is that he's always watching. He knows exactly what we're doing every second of every day. And... One verse that I kind of kind of thought went along with somebody's thoughts comes from Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 here and about Adam and Eve. And it says about Adam, Adam and Eve, when they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, Adam and his wife hid themselves through the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And that verse makes me wonder, what feeling will we have when it's our turn to see God? Are you ready to lay your works in front of God? Are you ready to even give him a progress report tonight? We know that we have to do that sometimes in the physical world to give some type of progress report. And if somebody was expecting us to have something done that we haven't got around to yet, that's typically not a very pleasant conversation. But I do know that we don't want to have that conversation with God to try to come up with an excuse for why we didn't give him our best because he already knows the answer anyway. He knows what our priorities are because he sees how we choose to spend our time each and every day. And so, are you proud of the work you're doing for God? Are you planning ahead and preparing yourself to meet him one day? And are you making yourself available? And if you haven't been doing those things, you can make yourself available tonight by accepting God's word and if you need to obey the gospel or need help with anything of any kind, you can come forward now as we stand and sing.